Okay, good morning, everybody. Um, we're just on five past, so we'll get started. Um, I think we'll have a few more people join as we go through. Um, welcome to Guernsey's fifth Global Entrepreneurship Week um, and our first event for the week with Barclays Eagle Lab. We are really pleased to welcome Anna, who's joining us today um, to talk to us about design thinking for beginners. Um, this is a topic that I think is really interesting at the moment, really relevant to local business um, and to all types of sectors and areas that, that people are developing. Um, so I'm going to pass over to Jez, who I'm sure many of you have met before, um, who's our Guernsey Barclays Eagle Lab um, individual, and um, he is going to talk us through what we're going to be doing today um, and then pass over to Anna. So thank you very much, Jess. Thanks, Lucy. Um, yeah, hi, everyone, and good morning. Um, thanks for joining uh, this morning's uh, workshop. So uh, today is uh, Design Thinking for Beginners. Uh, Anna's going to be doing the presentation, which will be around sort of 40 minutes, uh, and there'll be plenty of opportunity to go through Q&As. Um, as Lucy said, if you can put them into the, uh, the chat function, and I'll, I'll field them towards the end. Um, just, just as a sort of bit of background with Eagle Lab, so um, we're a, a network of, of co-working spaces and incubators across the UK, uh, and we work very closely with Digital Greenhouse here in Guernsey. Um, and, and today is really about skills development. So probably one of the, the primary pieces for Eagle Labs is, is skills development, uh, as, well as, uh, as well as helping founders and entrepreneurs to grow their businesses, um, to create jobs uh, and improve, uh, improve the economy. So that's really what we try and do. And obviously we provide banking services as a, as a function of that as well. Um, now, I appreciate in a virtual sense, it, it's not so straightforward to connect with other people. Um, it would be really great to connect with you um, post events. So please do um, get in touch via the Eagle Labs website or via Digital Greenhouse. It'd be great to, um, to carry on the conversation. Uh, and that will be with myself and I can connect you in with Anna. Um, and it would be great to get your feedback. So I will mention this at the end of the session, but there is a, a survey that the, the Digital Greenhouse put together as part of Global Entrepreneurship Week. So um, it would be great to understand what you found valuable, how we can improve uh, for the future. But uh, now to hand over to Anna. Anna's going to give a bit of background about herself, so I won't, I won't talk too much about that. But Anna is part of our uh, Eagle Labs engineers team. Um, so this is a virtual team across the UK um, in, in various labs uh, across our network. And um, yeah, Anna's, Anna's got a real um, experience and passion for problem solving and, and design thinking being a great tool for that. So uh, without further ado, um, I wish you, uh, thank you for participating today and I'll hand over to Anna. Hi everyone. Um, thanks for joining us today. Well, as Jess said, my name is Anna. I'm Edinburgh Eagle Lab engineer. And well, since I was a child, I have been passionate about how things work and how the things are made. So my curiosity led me to study product development and manufacturing engineering, where I discovered design thinking. Design thinking is one of my favorite topics, and I'm delighted today to talk about it. The aim of this workshop is to explain the very basic concept of the design thinking. Well, design thinking is an approach that is used for practical and creative problem solving. Our goal is to improve people's life through the experiences that they have. So if you are interested in solving problems for people, then you can practice design thinking. But what does design thinking understand as experiences? Well, Think about the last time that you had a tea, coffee, or a hot chocolate. Maybe it was this morning. Why did you drink it? What else were you doing at that time? Do you have a routine? Your answers to those questions are different than anyone else. So those answers represent your experience. So experience is the way a person feels um, what they think while they are doing something. Design thinking requires you to consider a person's experience in order to focus on their human needs. To explain the importance of the experience, we are going to analyze a case of study. So our 
first case of study today is Starbucks. Well, Jerry and Gordon, the original founders of Starbucks, had so much knowledge about coffee and they were so much passionate about it. They themselves were users. They understood the frustrations on, of not being able to locate a good coffee shop and understand the pain of other gourmet coffee lovers. At that time, the best coffee in their area was in McDonald's or Dunkin' Donuts. They, were really want, they really want a place where people can enjoy a cup of coffee without stress. So they opened a Starbucks. The place was a totally success, but they want to continue improving user experience. For that, the CEO had observed nearly 500 espresso bars in Milan and Verona. He took notes, photos, videos, he videographed Paris in action. He also observed menus, interior decor, espresso making techniques. He observed customers and noted the local habits and behaviors and the jobs to be done within a particular context. So to start with a very tiny place in Seattle to be the biggest coffee company in the world with 20, 24,000 places in 70 countries. Starbucks use customer journey maps to analyze the customer experience. With that, they can improve the pain points and innovate. They can analyze what the customer is thinking and feelings in different situations. Because if you have a good experience, you always repeat. So you could see in this picture how Starbucks analyzes all the different points during your experience journey. From the beginning, when you think, oh, I want a coffee, to the end when you leave the coffee shop. Let's continue talking about innovation. Well, there are three aspects which make a product, service, or solution successful. Desirability, feasibility, and viability. At this moment, I really think we should add another aspect that is related with climate change and sustainability. We need to keep in mind that innovation is not be the first. To innovate, we need to, to balance these four aspects properly to find the sweet spot. That balance is going to make the difference. In the same thinking, we think that solution, service, or product must be wanted and it has to fill customer needs and fit in their lives. For this reason, we always start with people and then we continue working on the rest. Let's explore why it's important to start with the desirability aspect. For that, we are going to analyze another case of a study. Well, this case of a study is about Apple. In one hand, we have Apple Newton. They launched in 1993, and it was that first period without Steve Jobs. Well, at that moment, Apple had great engineers and they focused to develop a destructive technology, but they forgot that they designed for people. Apple Newton device was quite good if we talk about technology. It was very advanced for that time, but I think people weren't prepared for that change. They didn't need a PDA at that moment. People had other needs. Apple really thought that, that device was an innovation, but people never integrate that device in their lives. In the other hand, of course, we have the iPod. People was waiting for these type of devices. They were using Bookmat and compact these devices for decades. Apple was not the first to launch a device with these characteristics, but they made a difference. How? Well, years before Apple, I don't know if the people remember, but they launched iTunes. It was a free program that you could use in Windows as well, where you can organize all your music and digitalize all your CDs. When the iPod arrived, people saw the opportunity to transfer very easily their music. You only need to plot your iPod and click transfer. If you remember other type of devices, the MP3 devices, you need to convert the music to another format and then pass to the device. So the process was not very easy. 
Also, the, the design of the iPod was very simple, similar to Pocket Radio, so the people who were familiar with the device was easy to use. You can see how Apple prepared the people and the society for that change and how they make that change very easy. I think that was the real innovation. Apple understood people and developed the product for them, but also prepared the people for, for that change. Well, we understand design thinking not only as a process to follow, we understand design thinking as a mindset as well. When you incorporate this mindset to your routine, you can identify more, more opportunities to develop ideas and to innovate. As I said before, we focus on people. That means that we want to understand human needs, behaviors, emotions, and values. We need to be curious, inquisitive, and open. Curiosity is one of the most powerful tools that we have. Uh, ask why, why it's like this. Be a child again and be surprised. We need to be an active part of this world. We need to be open to new possibilities and new environments. Because inspiration comes from being in this world, with having your eyes open and truly seeing and asking questions. We need to be visual. Use a simple language to share your ideas. A simple sketch is better than a paragraph. Pictures, drawings, photos are a universal language. Work with interdisciplinary teams, well, this is really, really important. Diverse teams help to understand complex problems and develop innovative solutions from different perspectives. Teams with people with different roles, ages, experiences, is one of the keys to unlock your business potential. Experiment and iterate, well, Design thinking believes that the best way to learn something is through experimentation. This involves the constant desire to learn by trying new things. Um, related to this, learn from failure, of course. For me, this is the most difficult one, and I'm still working on it. But when I have fear to fail, I try to remember Thomas Edison's famous sentence, I have not failed, I have just found 10,000 ways that won't work. Okay, so with these mindsets, we are going to start to talk about the design thinking process. In the last few decades, there were different models for design thinking process that have been introduced, such as the B School Design Thinking, IDU, Togo Diamond, IBM Design Thinking, Google Design Sprinting, and others. These models share a similar flow of phases that start with understanding and end with the product or service release. In this case, we're going to talk about the D-School process. The design thinking process can be broken down into five steps or phases, empathize, define, ideate, prototype, and test. The process is not linear. Sometimes we will need to come back to previous stages to continue working on the project. Like, let's explore each step with more detail. Well, the first step, as I said before, is empathize. Empathy is an important element of the design thinking, but what exactly it is and how can we develop it? Well, Design thinking empathy is a deep understanding of the problems and reality of the people that you are designing for. Empathy is our ability to see the world through other people's eyes, to understand their needs and their desires. The word is empathize, but what we are looking for in this stage is research and collection of data. These are the two types of data that we are looking for here. The quantitative data, is for example, how many times does someone click on something? How many likes have this post on Twitter? So it's basically the type of data that you can measure. And then we have the qualitative data. That is the data that we collect through observation. 
we are trying to then where we are trying to identify feeling needs and determine problems and pain points. Before continue, as I say, qualitative data is the data that we collect through observation. But how can we be a successful observer? Well, the first thing is drop your assumptions, judgments, and biases, remove your own view of the world, opinions, and thoughts, adopt humility, abandon preconcepts, ideas, and approach with beginner eyes, be a good listener, of course, listen with attention and carefully and always with respect. Show compassion, build a sense of care and deep concern to help the user. Of course, again, be curious. Curiosity allows us to dig into unexpected areas and uncover new insights. And of course, other thing is learn to understand body language. Many times people tell us more about how they act than what they say. I think with this clear, it, we could say we need to observe. We know how to observe, but who is my user? Well, one of the most common problem in this stage is identify your user. In design thinking, we focus on stream users. Stream users represent a small portion of the total number of users. Compared with the majority, they have more or less needs. That means that we focus on users that have special requirements and on users that never going to use that specific product or service. For example, at this moment, I'm working on a project uh, designing a product to help uh, with a specific subject in primary school. In this case, our stream users are children that have learning difficulties in that specific subject and children that are top in the class. When we speak to the stream users, we identify their amplified needs. We can pull out more meaningful insights and thus give us the potential to put, push ideas into different directions. With, when we identify the users, we can identify more needs than maybe the majority. When you research the majority, you are not going to see. When we are trying to please that majority, which is still a very diverse group, it's easy to end up designing something very generic and it's easy to replicate that exactly the same product that is already in the market. So when you design for the majority, you are not going to add value with your proposition. So during the empathize step, we should identify our stream users to start the research. To explain the importance of the stream users, I'm going to talk about another case of a study. That is also. Well, do you identify this? Do you have one in your kitchen? Well, Sam Farber was cooking with his wife she had the arthritis. She was complaining about the pillar, complaining that it was hurting her hands. His wife was a stream user of the product. He focused on solve that problem for people who had hand problems, but the result was very comfortable for everyone. This is one of the examples that when, you, when we focus on the stream users, we can identify opportunities and innovate. Let's continue with the empathy step. We say that in the first stage of the process is understand user needs. Okay, what that means? Well, this means observing and engaging with people in order to understand them on a physical and emotional level. To achieve this, we should, do, we, we should start doing our research about previous products, services or problems. We can do interviews with our stream users we can do surveys, we can record the, uh, the user experience to document it. We can shadow in our user, user during a few days, or we can ask them to write journals. During this process, I always recommend to take notes also about your feelings. What do you think and what are you feeling during the process is important because with this note, we can identify our own judgment and eliminate them later. 
Some tools that can help us in this process are product sketching, empathy maps, or user experience maps, as we saw in the Starbucks case of study. If your aim is to do a product research in order to improve it, I will recommend to sketch previous products and because that can help to understand even better the product that is already in the market. These are some of the drawing that I made in the university to understand how some product works. I can tell you that after a few hours watching the same product, you'll start to have a deep understanding and deep knowledge about the, that product. And you can start to see possibilities to redesign it or how to improve a specific part of that product. Other famous tool that we have is empathy maps. Well, an empathy maps captures the knowledge about the user behaviors and attitudes. It's, just, it's a useful tool to help teams to understand the users. Empathy maps vary in format, but they have some common core elements. So it's a large sheet of paper that is divided into sections with the user always in the center. Each section is labeled with a category that explores the user external world and internal mindset. What the user is doing, seeing, hearing, thinking, and feeling, including pains and gains. So first of all, we are going to spend time with the user. We are going to collect information, and then we will go and fill the empathy map. I recommend to do also a cultural and historical research about our user life because maybe we don't understand some behaviors that are normal in other cultures. Well, why empathy maps are important? Well, as I said before, humans sometimes say something and do the opposite. So these maps help us to identify that type of things. Okay, so after spending time with our user, um, collecting all the data that we think we need, we can go to the next step that is defined. At this point, we had a lot of information that we need to analyze. In this step, we are talking about problem definition. We are going to define the problem. After the empathy step, we probably think we know what the problem is and it is important to drop off again your ideas and analyze information again without any judgment. Also, we need to remember that in this step, we are not looking for solutions. In this step, we need to define the problem. Basically, what, what we are going to do is take the data that we have from the previous step and see the science to learn in the process, in the, in, to learn in that process. We look for insights, we look for needs. Sometimes after these, we found that we need more data and we need to come back again to the, new, the, the previous step. There are many methods that we could use in this process. We are going to analyze data. We can use also the five whys. If we start to identify problems, we, we could go into layers of why is this happening? Why are they feeling that way? Why, why, why? Be a child again, be curious to find the main problem. Another tool that we normally use is how might we? How might we provide this service with our structural experience? How might we design this handle to be more user-friendly? Asking all these questions, provide more details to define the problem. We need to remember again that we are not looking for solutions. In this step, we only need to define the problem. For this reason, it's important to say that we define or identify the needs and insights as a verb. For example, in this step, we will say she needs to commute. In that way, we open the possible solution for a bike, electric scooter, a subway, or an electric bike. When we think we have identified and defined the main problem, we can start with the next phase. Define. Now you are ready to generate ideas. A solid background of knowledge from the first two phases means that you can start to think outside the box. I did is probably my favorite. In this step, we are coming up with the many solutions or ideas possible. We want quantity and we want diversity of ideas of solutions. 
we need to keep in mind that in this process is the quantity and not the quality because we can determine the quality later. To remember this tip, I always tell the people how many frogs we need to kiss to find the prince. It's better to have one million or 10. With ideas exactly the same, getting as many ideas out at the beginning of the process is, is the critical part. For that, we need to suspend again our judgment, not only for our own ideas, also for other people's ideas. As we said before, it's very important to work in with interdisciplinary teams. And I think during the ideas step is critical. Uh, the most important the most important thing in this stage is look for alternative ways and alternative views for the problem and identify innovative solution for the problem statement that you have created. Some of the methods that we use in ideation and ideation are mind maps, brainstorming, sketches, storyboards, and sometimes role playing can help to generate ideas. Well, when we have a good amount of idea. We can start to identify what are the best ones in order to prototype them in the next step. This step is all about experimentation and turning ideas into physical products or services. The objective of this process is fail early in order to learn when it doesn't cost you too much. For that reason, it's important to develop all the prototypes that you can to test it in the, with the user in the future. We are looking to make all the prototypes from the ideas that you, you had from the previous step. Again, how many prototypes we need to develop? Go for quantity. If we have 10 instead of two, you will get more information during the test step. The test step. Sorry. How we prototype, well, this is really important. At the beginning, we are looking for low fidelity models. For example, you can make your product using paper, cardboard, phone. You can draw your app or your website and explain. When you click here, you will go directly to that screen. You could see that, that, that idea on the picture. If you're designing a space, you can also do walkthroughs. When it's, this is like when you buy a new house and it's totally empty. Uh, and you invite your family and friends and you tell them, well, we're going to put a big table here with a bench and we're going to buy two sofas for that space and we're going to change that door and we're going to change that world color. That is also prototyping. If we come back to the OXO case of a study, how many prototypes do you think Sam Farber did? probably around 100. You can see in the left picture that the majority of them are made with foam and because that is, the, is one of the easiest and cheapest way to have a 3D prototype. Other case of a study is Dyson. Normally the people don't believe in the power of making low fidelity models using cheap materials such as cardboard or paper. In this picture, you could see how Dyson developed the product starting with a very simple model to start the next step of the design thinking process, that is test. So this is the next step that I'm going to talk about, but I'm not going to say that it's the final stage because as I said before, this is not a linear process. The objective of this step is learn and redefine our product and service. For that, we will need to test our ideas and our prototypes. This step can provide many learning opportunities to help you learn more about your user, and opportunities to redefine your prototype and even improve your problem statement. When you are conducting tests, you can you should probably pay attention to the prototype, the context, the scenario, and which you are testing. Uh, how you interact with the user, how, they, how you observe, and how you collect that feedback. To help plan the test, there are a number of guidelines that you could follow. The first 
One is let your user compare alternative. As I said before, it's important to have a good number of prototypes. Tell the user, well, what do you think is better? What do you think if we're talking about colors, what do you prefer? Show, don't tell, let the user experience the prototype. If you don't tell them how to use it, you can probably observe if your product, service, or app is easy to understand, easy to follow. Ask users to talk through their experience. Ask them to talk about what they are thinking, feeling, what they are interacting with the design. Find that you give them a prologue and they will say, oh, this is really comfortable. This handle is very easy to take. I, I like this. I like the, the touch experience. All of that feedback is very interesting for you and will help you to, to innovate and have the best product on the market. Observe, again, we talked before the power of the body language. There is when we can identify, hmm, the user is happy with this one, but looks like that he's uncomfortable with that one. He don't know how to use that or maybe is have a confusing phase, all that type of data is very, very important. And then ask with follow-up questions if we, during all this test stage, you could take a lot of um, data and then ask questions. How do you feel about that? How do you think if we change this small thing and we move it to that other prototype? Because other thing that people don't realize is when you have 10 or 20 prototypes, then after the test stage, maybe you can combine pieces from one, pieces from the other, and make a better product. And finally, remember that design thinking is a learning process and we need to be open to fail. The ideal endpoint of the design thinking process, when you know you have done a great job, is when the product or service satisfies the four tests of desirability, feasibility, viability, and sustainability. And with this, we finish our presentation today. I hope you enjoy it and we are open for questions. Thanks for listening. Great stuff, Anna. Thank you so much for that. It was really, uh, really interesting and it's uh, certainly a subject I'm unfamiliar with. So I, I've got a few questions um, that I'll pose to begin with. And uh, as Anna said, if you can uh, post your questions into the chat um, and I'll, I'll field them uh, as and when they come in. But just to, to kick off, um, I can see we've probably got, uh, I think we'll probably give it sort of 10, maybe 15 minutes, see what questions come in. We can always uh, give a bit of time back to people as well if, if we need to. So um, Anna, yeah, I had a question just in terms of the stages. What, um, what sort of time scale would you apply to each stage? Is, is it a, a sort of formula that you would say, you know, front end it with more time spent on the, on the research? Or how would you look at that as a, as a sort of question? I mean, for me, the most important stage is the empathy stage. It's where you can identify what opportunities you have. So for me, you need to spend enough time there then the prototype and the ideation step, you need to go quickly. The brainstorming should be really quick because when you, you know, you, you have a day and you need to put all the ideas out, it's better to have like a short deadline so you don't start to make, to say some excuses that, well, next day probably we'll have more ideas. No, I prefer to do a shorter ideation step. Um, of course, the prototype being well, the prototyping and the test for me goes together because we normally go to test, then we, we define our prototype, we go again to test. So that could take time. And I think the test step should be also long to capture all the knowledge for our user. Uh, but of course, this is going to change the depend of the design thinking model that you use. Uh, for example, we have the Google Design Sprint, Google Design Sprint have one day for each step. Uh, and it's, you cannot talk about empathy in the next day. So you finish 
that day. So it's in five days, you should have your design thinking process finished. Okay, thanks, Anna. Um, again, just, just to reiterate, if anyone's got any questions, if you can and pop them in the, in the Q&A there, that'd be great. Um, I've got another question, Anna. Um, I think it's one that comes up quite a bit, but are there any, um, any sort of further resources, books, et cetera, that you would recommend for people who want to carry on the learning process? Yeah, I, one of the books that I always recommend to people that want to know a little bit more about same thinking is Change by Design from Tom Kelly. It's really, really interesting. And have a lot of um, examples about this. It, and the other one is the podcast from Ideo. Ideo is a design thinking consultancy company. It's really, really interesting. Um, and there you could find a lot of uh, different approaches, different solutions. They are very, very creative. So I really recommend Ideal Podcast. And also in Ideal website, you could find a lot of different resources. Great. Thanks, Anna. Um, Rob's just given some great feedback there. I, I, I agree, Rob. I think it's been a brilliant uh, presentation. As I say, if you've got, got any questions, feel free to, to post them. Um, I, I'm going to carry on with the questions, Anna. I, I think uh, one that came for me uh, came to me was applications of design thinking because in your presentation you talk about products uh, in, in the main but would you give any other examples where design thinking as a process can be used yeah, of course i mean design thinking can be used in well for everything i suppose also if you mind that you want to improve the user experience in your shop or for example in a bar case branch you can use design thinking to identify what the people need, how to be more user-friendly, uh, this area that maybe for other people that are not connected with technology could be difficult for them. How can we, that, how can we be more user-friendly on that part? So you could use design thinking in each process. Uh, I think on online, you could find lots and lots of examples, I know banks, are using design thinking, uh, the big shops are using design thinking, uh, Airbnb is one of the design thinking companies, they're starting thinking outside the box and how can we improve that uh, travel uh, market. Uh, so I think you have applications everywhere. Yeah, yeah, I certainly uh, see more and more uh, the visualization coming through and, and using canvas type um, canvas type uh, visualizations the one you alluded to I think it was the empathy empathy map um, so that's something I, I'm certainly familiar with uh, for example the business model canvas when you're looking at sort of strategic a strategic view of a business and and, their, and how they're gonna uh, grow how they're gonna make money etc so um, yeah. yeah, I've had a comment come through um, just here from Rob, so I'm just going to read it out. Not sure I agree on the teams versus working independently. Working alone can be very productive, but then bringing your ideas to the team. So both are important. Do you uh, agree with that, Anna? Yeah, I mean, the, I always recommend the teams to work first alone because sometimes we are afraid to share our ideas and to we are afraid to do our own research. So I always recommend the people to do the research alone and then work as a team later. So everyone has their own view and their own perspective. And I think that's the most important thing. And then it's very important to create a safe space to talk in your team so the people is not afraid to share crazy ideas because in the same thinking, crazy ideas are always welcome. Um, so yeah. Definitely work first alone, do your own research, see how you view the problem because probably your colleague is going to be the problem from other angle. So I think that is going to be very interesting when you're going to the brainstorming stage. Thanks, Anna. And uh, Rob Rob's said good reply. So yeah, thanks for the question, Rob, as well. Thanks for uh, engaging on that. Um, 
So I, I'm mindful we're just coming up to quarter two. There, there is more time um, for questions, but um, we're, we haven't seen any come through as yet. So I'm just going to um, sort of leave it to Anna, I guess. Is there, is there any other points that you feel you'd wish to share um, before we sort of close the event? Yeah, well, I want to tell the people that don't be afraid to be creative. I think when we are a child, we are all creative small people and then when we go to adults we say no i'm not creative no everyone is creative so don't be afraid to be outside the box to think different because that's going to make the difference in the future for your business and also for your life great stuff we have had one one further comment here from rob actually um have you worked with the scottish government no <laughs> <laughs> no but i know it's scottish government Supply design thinking to analyze what is happening in different areas. Yeah, great. Okay, brilliant, Anna. Well, thank you uh, so much. It's been really, really um, helpful, really valuable uh, presentation this after, uh, this morning. And um, just want to say thank you also to everyone who's joined. Um, we've had a, a small but perfectly formed group. Um, so hopefully, you all got something that you can take away and make a, a change in terms of uh, what you've learned today. Um, and just to, just to flag again that we have got um, a survey that will come out uh, as part of Global Entrepreneurship Week. So please do uh, give us your feedback. It's really helpful and that'll uh, help us improve for future events. So with that, I'll say uh, good morning and thanks everyone. Have a great week. Thank you.